I'm here with Tony, our engine builder, and myself, Florence, to show you guys some of the troubles that we're seeing more commonly than ever with the S65 V8 engine from the E92 M3. You can see we've got a fully dressed one here, a half disassembled one here, and one, two, three engine blocks here that are bare. The purpose of the video today is just to show you guys uh, the failure that we're seeing more commonly than ever, which isn't rod bearings. Um, we all know that the rod bearings are a common, not a problem, but a, a common factor on these engines that are addressed with a, a routine bearing change. Uh, if we don't get there quick enough, they pick up and spin a bearing and cause damage to a crankshaft and a one or two rods and are rebuildable, but it's a costly exercise. However, what we want to show you today is the bigger problem, which is the main bearings or rather the number one main bearing. There's five main bearings in these cranks and blocks. And we want to show you a, a number of uh, factors with opened engines and bearings and cranks to, and explain what we're seeing and thinking is happening here to create awareness because most people just want to get their rod bearings routinely serviced in their engines, which is great. But we're now trying to you know, educate people on the bigger problem or the same uh, consequential damage if this isn't addressed. So I'm going to hand you over to Tony and he's going to probably start with showing you some bearings, some crankshafts on the bench over here, and then we'll move around and show you, you know, we've got one, two, three blocks here that are uh, cactus. Um, this one here is also locked up. This one's just come in, which we think's locked as well, but that's just in here to be stripped down. And we've got another one coming from WA from another workshop. Uh, with a similar problem we think and there's a few others in the shop that we haven't even looked at yet So Tony, do you want to show the guys what you got on the bench over there, please? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll add to that. I just want to mention that we're doing this because we've had quite a bit of experience with S65s and uh, Because we've seen so many like, yeah, Come in yeah. and the rate and the cause or the you know, the actual damage That's why we thought okay, we need to probably let someone know or let people know about um, what we're seeing and explain to you how we're dealing with it. I think it's, yeah, it's the awareness, yeah. isn't it? Because yeah. I, I had a customer earlier on this week, which has prompted us to do this because I can see people are hungry for information. It's really good that we share this, is we explain the problem over the phone or when they come in to see us and they're like, oh, I've never heard of that before. You mm. know, main bearings don't fail. And let me go and do some research on the internet yeah. and I'll make a decision. And yeah. then they come back and say, oh, I can't really see much about a main bearing problem, you, you know, yeah. can you please explain? So this is uh, going to show a lot of people or, or you guys and, and others what we're seeing and that the last five engines that are here in a row have all suffered a main bearing problem. So, um, you know, five out of five is a 100% main bearing problem. It's not one in 20, it's becoming all of them. So, Tony, yeah. let's so, have a look. Just to uh, add to a little small detail everyone that's watching probably knows or is aware or or can check the S65 4 litre V8 was subsequently released after the S85 5 litre V10 <coughs> so what that means is that uh, quite a few of the components as some of you may be aware are common to both engines so conrods and pistons for example but what the designers have changed that I think is something to do with the problem is the timing chain arrangement at the front of the crankshaft. The front of the crankshaft and the timing chain arrangement is different. It's a lot different to the S85. We don't see this problem with the number one main bearing on S85s. S85 issues are pretty much the same with regard to the rod bearings because, it, as I said, it's the same component. But this number one main bearing doesn't show up with the S85s. What I've got over here are examples of uh, stages of damage and indications of what could be the cause or what is the cause this is a set of main bearings from an engine that we overhauled and it didn't have a main bearing failure but what's really interesting about this set of bearings here is that the indications of where the load and the wear is is a little bit unusual this is the number one main bearing you can see that this is the lower half of the bearing and on the crankshaft you expect most of the wear and the load to be on the lower half all of the conrods are trying to push the crank down out the bottom of the engine but look at the indication on the upper bearing. Now, if we look at the other bearings, here's number two, lower, upper, you can see the higher wear indication on the bottom, as you'd expect. Same for the rest of them. 
they all show similar signs of heavier loading on the lower half. So this tells me that for some reason the crankshaft is coming closer to the upper bearing at number one. The chains and the chain tensioners on the S65 seem to me to be much stronger than the S85. The S85, like I said, only, it only has a single row timing chain per bank, whereas the S65 has a double row per bank. So there's a lot of force here trying to pull the front of the crankshaft up. And I think that could be part of the reason. It's part of the reason. Now here's a crankshaft we took out of an engine that's just started to make contact. You can see the metal transfer here already from the bearing. You see a copper coloured material and a bit of heat. Obviously it's only the front half, which is a little bit interesting too. As the crankshaft, if my theory is correct, is being lifted, you would expect that the, the furthest point here would, would make contact first and that shows up here. It could just be a coincidence. But yeah, you can see here on, the, on that bearing as well, you can see uh, you know, contact right at the front there. You can see a brighter mark, like a heavier contact right at the front edge. Now, here's, if, if this carries on, and it could be a matter of milliseconds or a very short time later, what happens is that metal to metal contact generates a lot of heat and friction and grabs the main bearing in the block and then takes it with it as it's rotating. And, and as soon as it starts to rotate, the oil feed hole, which feeds the bearing, is blocked as the bearing rotates. That oil also travels then through to this big end bearing. So once the oil is blocked to this big end bearing, the consequential damage is this bearing fails as well. And on this one, then because you've got an adjacent rod running right next to it, the heat then carries on and the damage, and then it, this one's failed as well. But you can see a higher metal uh, transfer on this front one compared to the second one there. So you can sort of see the flow of damage as it's going through here. This one's had the same type of failure. These bearings are actually fused onto the crankshaft. I'm not even going to bother trying to get them off, but it'll look very similar to this. So here's another prime example. We see this quite often. So uh, once the crankshaft is damaged to this point, it's basically scrap. This, it's a very a difficult or almost impossible uh, repair procedure for it. Um, so, so I, Tony, yeah. why don't we go down here and look at this engine with the crank still in? Oh yeah, and, and we can <clears> show <throat> how this bearing. When we start to strip has engines, moved. that's right. We look as soon as we get the the pan off, we look for that number one main bearing if the engine won't turn. And here you can see the parting line of the bearing, the main bearing. You can see that little indication there, where the two halves of the bearing join. Now the parting lines should be where the bed plate meets the block further down there. They're about 20 millimetres around from there. So that's an indication that this bearing has already spun in the block. So this one's damaged already. It's locked, it won't move. All of the Conrods have side clearance, they're free to move. I can move all of them. So there's no bearings, no big end bearings picked up. The problem is here with this main bearing. So what we do with this is that we, we've said, okay, um, it's such a huge expense and such a waste to to, to uh, throw these blocks away, but they basically are scrap in most cases. So what we've done as our, our version of a repair is we have CNC uh, steel inserts machined, and then we, we uh, machine out the bore of the, of the main bearing here, and then we, we profile the bearing to the same shape as the, as the oil uh, flow from the other main bearings in here. And then uh, this is all set up accurately and then this has to be indexed and then machined out to the right diameter to match the, the axis for the other main bearings. So it's precise and the same size within factory tolerances. And then we pin the bearing in there. We, we uh, you know, produce the oil hole here. This one just has to have the oil, uh, the bearing tangs uh, uh, put in place so that the bearing's located. And then uh, we'll put this one, this one will be uh, good to go. So that's an effective repair. We've done this before. It seems to be successful. Um, there's something else that I do, and that is that I increase the, the, uh, the bearing clearance on this number one main <coughs> bearing. I can't stop the front of the crankshaft from bending upwards, but I can move it away from, from the crankshaft by increasing the bearing clearance. Uh, obviously, I'm looking to increase it mainly for that upper half. Um, now, I can do that either by, uh, with a bearing or by linishing the crankshaft to give it more clearance. I'm not too worried if I give it a, another two and a half hundredths or another thousandths of an inch clearance for the sake of saving the block and saving the engine. 
I also increased the, the oil flow diameter in this main gallery here, only half a millimetre, which gives me just under six square millimetres of extra oil flow through there. The only reason I do that is because that this gallery, this bore from the main gallery, also feeds the lubricating oil squirter to all of the timing chain lubricators here at the front. So technically it is robbing a little bit of volume from the flow of that number one bearing, but I'm not saying that's the problem. I'm just uh, increasing the potential flow uh, to the bearing because of the potential loss. It's probably a very small loss to the lubricator, but by increasing the bore, I'm guaranteeing that the volume should be the same to this bearing as it is the others. And we've had good success with it. Now this one, when it goes to a point where this one has, hasn't been sleeved yet, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera. This one's actually split the block. You can see the split there, all the way down the oil hole, right down to where that uh, chain lubricator bore is there. And you can see the aluminium here is just all sort of melted away and picked up. So this one, it's unlikely we can do anything with this one, but we'll look at it later. And uh, here's another one um, that's, a, that's another damaged block of the same situation. Um, and so I think with the evidence that we've seen so far and the, the amount of damage that we're seeing, uh, I, I think we're, we're on the right track to try and take care of it. Now what you can do is if you're doing a, a rod bearing replacement, which is a good idea because obviously, you know, it's, it's a standard thing with these engines, at the same time is, is do the main bearings and think about uh, increasing the main bearing clearance on the number one main bearing, especially on the upper half. You can do that with a HX type, uh, you know, plus one thou or two and a half hundredths oversized bearing, um, and just to give you that little bit of extra clearance on that number one main and, and replace the bearings, obviously. And um, I think that's the best chance that you've got to, to try and stop this kind of damage. It's catastrophic damage. Yeah, so um, it's unfortunate when this happens because if it's just a rod bearing problem, like you could see on those other cranks before where number one or two or a single journal suffers a, a rod bearing spinning, <clears throat> we can just replace the crank in one rod and get on with it. When the block's affected, when we've actually damaged the bore in the tunnel, it's, it, it's a very multi-staged and tedious process to do that repair. It looks simple, it is a simple repair and it's very effective, but to do that and get it done accurately is, is quite a, a tedious and lengthy process to get done. It's quite costly as well. It, it robs us a lot of time when we go to assemble an engine and we have to do a repair like this we can lose a month or so just doing this and the accuracy is so critical that once all this is done if we don't have a straight tunnel and we put the crank in we may have our clearance on the bearing but we need to be sure that the crank still has its clearance to avoid that contact on the the upper part of number one main which is effectively the crank bending up we need to know that we've still got that upper bend clearance or a factory straight tunnel and that's the trick so uh, we've been successful with the ones we've done so far, so we think we've got it right. And we've got a, you know, this engine's ready to go together now with that repair done. It's probably good that that repair's there too, because if we ever do suffer another front bearing problem on one of these engines and we've got that steel in there, we can, hopefully it's affected, we can pop those slippers out and put another pair in, mm. and the blocks mm. doesn't have to go through another repair. So it's kind of like a serviceable front main repair now as well with that method. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, that's. hope that helps you guys understand a little bit more about these engines. And I guess generally speaking, they're not a, a flawed engine. They're not an engine that BMW didn't get right. It's a tight clearance engine. It's very highly strung. We have very narrow conrods and a high spinning engine, you know, 8200 plus uh, RPM standard. And they just require that heavier maintenance that other engines don't, like Toyota engines or LSs and other things you need to be prepared to get in and do these bearings as a service item and the engine will live on forever, um, treated the right way and, and maintained the, the correct way. You know, race engines are rebuilt race to race or every second race for that exact reason. They're tight clearance engines, they've done their work, then they need these components changed. This is an in-between, a, a road car and a race engine. It's probably closer to race. Um, so keep that in mind and be prepared and, and your engine will live on. So I hope that helps you guys uh, have a bit more insight and put any comments if you've got any questions below and we'll be happy to answer them or call the shop or send us an email. Thank you.